nice introduction and uh, for being here. It's really nice to be able to speak with like-minded colleagues uh, over a beer and discuss uh, well future projects and, uh, and new data. So um, I'll be showing some of the work that we've been doing over the last two years um, in, the, uh, in our Faculty of Human Movement Sciences. The first thing that I need to mention here is that the, how we started this. And um, uh, before a lecture, just f five minutes before a lecture started uh, during COVID, uh, a clinician called me and she said, these patients that I see in the clinic, uh, these long COVID patients, there is something wrong with them. Uh, they've constantly fatigued and I'm pretty sure it's nothing to do with their psychological mindset. There is really something wrong in their skeletal muscle, likely. Can we study this? Um, so Michelle, uh, here on the top, um, uh, she was right from the beginning, there is something wrong with these patients, but we didn't know back then what it was. And um, also just commented on the, com uh, the, the comment before about uh, TV programs. Uh, this was uh, also a few minutes before a live TV show in the Netherlands where we were able to explain our research to the general public in the Netherlands. Over the years, uh, we've had a few, com uh, well, a lot of actually students working in our lab uh, on this topic. So uh, the Braden and uh, Jelle, who started his PhD uh, two days ago, which at the start of this conference, uh, this was on the boat on, from Amsterdam to uh, to Cambridge. Here, um, uh, they are here in the in the audience. So uh, please talk to them if you uh, if you have more information, if you if you want more information. So the first thing, of course, that we need to discuss is the is the the, the different symptoms that relate to 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 long COVID and ME CFS, and the majority of them uh, relate to fatigue. And this post-exertional malaise, and um, we don't really know what this post-exertional malaise is doing and wh wh what it is caused by. Um, and I, I, I don't have to uh, go into a lot of details here with you about uh, the different uh, the, the, the different hypotheses uh, that is that are that are underlying ME and and, and, uh, and long COVID. Um, but the, the the specific symptom of post-exertional malaise intrigued me from the beginning, because. Post-exertion malaise is not the same as fatigue. If you ask patients what they suffer from, it's not just only fatigue, it's also the worsening of symptoms uh, upon exercise or mental or cognitive uh, exertion. And this is something else than just exertional fatigue. Uh, everyone is fatigued after, uh, after running around, uh, 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 like running a marathon or, or, or shorter. Uh, but this, this worsening of symptoms that is super interesting for us as, a, as an exercise physiologist. Because it's the, the fact that, that, that general symptoms or new symptoms develop after 40, uh, 48 hours, um, after a physical, co cognitive or mental exertion. And we know also now from, the, from, from, from talking to patients that it's a patient and time dependent threshold. So we, we don't really know what this threshold is that above which this, 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 this post-exertion malaise is being induced. But we also know that it can last for sometimes just only days. Uh, others uh, suffer from it for weeks or even months. And of course, that's because of this overlap um, in this particular symptom between uh, long COVID and MECFS and other, likely other post-acute infectious diseases, we think this is a very specific symptom uh, that gives us an underlying idea about the pathophysiology of, the, of ME as well as long COVID. So that's what we wanted to study. And as an exercise physiologist, I find it super intriguing because I keep telling all my students over the last 10 years, exercise is good for you. But in this case, it's not so good for you. So exercise is not medicine for patients with long COVID and ME. And ME. So that, of course, is, is counterintuitive and that is then for us the, the reason to, to do the study. The other thing that because I see a lot of clinicians and, and patients in the, in, in the room, this was a very nice uh, uh, cartoon that I, that I found online from one of the ME uh, support groups. So if you would see a patient on one day, uh, may, she, may, she or he may look perfectly fine and, and, and there's nothing actually to see about them. But the next day they suffer from this, this spam, which makes them really uh, uh, suffer a lot. So this, is, is, it's likely more intuitive to, to look at the patients when they are going, undergoing or going through this PEM than when they have uh, just been uh, resting a lot and preparing themselves to see a doctor. So this is the, 
the, the, the, the starting point of the, uh, of the, the, the research that we, that we performed. And uh, you probably have seen this recent paper of us in the Nature Communication that attracted a lot of attention worldwide, um, a lot of attention, um, and also a lot of criticism. So uh, what I will do here, and I will go through the, 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 the publication and try to, at the end, also come back to some of the criticism that we receive and how we are going to deal with, with that or how we're going to, to respond to that. So instead of, uh, well, stu normally studying post-exertion malaise, you do that by a two-day exercise test. So the first day you do, you induce the PEM, and then the next day you ask patients back and ask to do the similar exercise test. So that would essentially confirm whether someone has PEM or not. The thing is that it's, it's rather, uh, inf not, not invasive, but it's not ethical that, that, that's, you know, that, that's tricky because you're actually worsening the PEM. So instead of that, we opted for a two-day biopsy experiment. So what we did, we asked patients to come a week before an, uh, a cardiopulmonary exercise test to, take, to ask for blood, if they would took uh, venous blood, and a facet lateralis muscle biopsy. Then, a week later, we induced the PEM by an exercise uh, test on the bike, but also we used that bike to assess their exercise capacity so that we could possibly distinguish bet bet between fatigue, the symptom of fatigue, from the developments of post exertional malaise. And then a day later, when there was the, the, the post exertional malaise was induced, uh, we asked them back into the hospital to take another bi muscle biopsy. We took blood and other also questionnaires. So we followed them up, up to seven days after uh, the, uh, the experiment. And the clinicians that super uh, actually important to mention, uh, the clinicians that took the biopsy, they, they took that free of charge in between their re regular uh, uh, surgeries. So sometimes they were running through the halls, going from the surgery room back to our bi biopsy room and back in the, again, or on that free day. So it's really, really great uh, uh, con uh, contribution from, from the team. Something that's su super important to mention, uh, particularly for, cl for, for clinicians, is how were the patients characterized? So they were diagnosed, the long COVID patients, um, were diagnosed based on interviews and medical history. And the inclusion criteria ha had to include post exertion malaise because that's the symptom that we specifically studied. The exclusion criteria was that they, had, they couldn't be hospitalized during an acute COVID infection and other comorbidities that could explain their fatigue. So what we did is we, we uh, opted for 21 and 26 patients, uh, 25 patients, sorry, uh, and equal sexes, so we had a 50% male-female divide. Normal uh, um, um, uh, age, uh, weight, and, and height, and, and you can also see that the weekly hours uh, working uh, went from 36 from the patients, or from the controls, to five only in the patients. Something that we have uh, f found or as, uh, as a or heard as a criticism is that the amount of steps was rather low in the patients, and that is indeed the case. If you see here on the left-hand side, you see the, the average steps per day with, a, with, a, with a, um, an actigraph, no, 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 sorry, not an, act, um, an er, an, um, a, step, a step count measurement. We do see a reduced uh, step counts in the patients compared to the controls, but if you compare it to an actual average American, it's not that much less, actually. Sorry for the Americans in the room. <laughs> But that's, the, that's how it is. I mean, they, are where, they were, of course, less active, but that's not that they're a bit bedridden. We now actually also included another group of uh, MECFS patients that are matched uh, in terms of age, weight, and height, uh, and that's something that we're currently analyzing to see whether also in the MECFS group we see similar characteristics, see similar things. So that's the project that, that Brayden and Yella are working on uh, as we speak. So we first looked at the excess capacity and, and, and see whether excess, the reduced excess capacity was a, was a symptom that was consistent across all long COVID patients. That was not really the case because while the averages were lower, here on the left hand side or the VO2 max here, um, there were some patients that actually had relatively high VO2 maxes still, but still they all reported to be patients and uh, 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 where PEM was induced. So, so a lower maximum oxygen uptake consumption doesn't require to you to have uh, uh, to be a patient essentially that's a, a first argument also for or the second argument based on the, the step count but also this this argument doesn't really uh, work in terms of explaining everything by deconditioning 
What we also found is that if you look inside of the, in the skeletal muscle, this is a section here that we stained for fiber typing. So there's a uh, muscles that can contain white and red muscle fibers. The red fibers, they are more fatigue resistant. And with that, you can go on for a long time. And the white fibers, are, they're very uh, fatigue fatigable. What we saw is that at type one fibers, the, the oxidative fibers here on the left hand side, uh, they were, they were low, an average lower in the patients compared to the controls. On the other hand, they, the patients had more of these fast fatigable fibers explaining how that, uh, that possibly could explain their reduced excess capacity. What we also found out is if you look at the size of the fiber, it generally corresponds nicely in the controls to the peak power that, we, that, we, that you can maintain on the bike. But in the, in the patients, you see that the, the intercept uh, of that line is, is reduced. So for the same fiber cross-section area, the same muscle size, they could get less power out of it. They could get less power out of that same muscle fiber size. On the far right, you see here a marker for mitochondrial density on the x-axis, and again, the VO2 max on the y-axis. In healthy controls, this is a nice linear relationship between the amount of mitochondria that you have in your muscle and how much, how, much, how much oxygen you can take up during an exercise test. That relationship was completely gone in the patients here in the red circles. So that suggested to us that while you may have some, some mitochondria, they, they cannot produce the same amount of energy that you, would, that you would get if you would be a healthy control. So that suggests that there is something intrinsically wrong with the metabolism. So that's why we looked further and, and, and went into the uh, oxidative capacity uh, uh, measurements of, uh, of these patients. So we measured their actual oxygen cons consumption possibility or ca capacity in the, in, the, in the mitochondria. And you see that here on the left-hand side, the baseline measurements, so before we uh, asked patients to come back, so before the PEM, there was already a reduction in the mitochondrial density or mitochondrial capacity. And that was all re reduced even after uh, the, um, uh, the, the PEM induction. If you look at the mitochondrial density markers, so you see here uh, sections that we stained for mitochondrial density. Um, we see there is hardly any difference, however, between the patients and the control. So while they may have the mitochondria, they do not able, they're not able to get the oxygen or the ATP production, energy production. We also saw with metabolomics that there are various pathways that were uh, affected in the patients, particularly here in the purine synthesis pathway, which is the, the pathway that produces ATP. And that's the, your, your currency for en energy currency in the muscle, as well as the TCA cycle intermediates here on the bottom. That is the, 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 the metabolites that, that essentially uh, are used by the mitochondria to produce energy. On the other hand, the glycolysis pathway here in, in, in red, in the red colors here, they were not so much affected and even tended to be a bit higher in the patients, suggesting there is a shift away from oxidative phosphorylation to more glycolysis, which is, fit past, which is consistent with the idea that, uh, that, that in the patients we see more fatigue. So the, the idea back then, about a year and a half ago when we studied this, was that everything was explained in an easy way by a microglot theory. And the theory that, that is, goes as follows. Um, there's a group in South Africa that suggested that these microglots in the, mo in, in the blood can clog up uh, capillaries, and as a result, downstream, you have a reduced flow, and you, you don't get, uh, you essentially don't get the energy and then the oxygen supply. So the, we thought, let's just see whether this explains all our results. So what we did, we used the same markers uh, as the, uh, the group in South Africa did, in, in green, you see the, uh, um, the, the, the THT stains. Uh, they are the, so the, 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 we call them the microclots or the amyloid containing deposits. Um, but we saw then that they, they, they were higher in the, in the, in, in, in the tissue in the, in, the, in the patients. We actually quantified it here on the right hand side. So that in the baseline, there was a, a clear difference between the patients and the controls. But interestingly, if we, if we search where exactly these microclots are, we didn't find them inside the, skeleton, in, inside the endothelial cells and inside the capillaries. So here on the bottom, you see the same uh, type of uh, analysis, but then we, um, we marked uh, the, 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 um, the capillaries in pink here, and you see in green the, these sort of so-called so microclots. And they, don't, they don't seem to be inside the capillary. So we never found a, one of these stains inside the capillary. 
However, what we did notice is that after, after exercise, the amount of clots was, was much higher. So we do think it contributes to some sort of uh, PEM, but we have no clue exactly what they do there, how they are formed, and what we ha what, what, how, re how it relates to symptoms. We also actually figured out that we maybe we thought maybe they're in the lymphatic vessels, which was not the case either. So also in the lymphatic vessels, these clots were not accumulating. So when we stained these, um, uh, the, the, we looked at the, mu the muscle sections, we realized that there, there were areas that look, didn't look perfectly right. So then we went to the local pathology department and we uh, asked them to score uh, our muscle sections for uh, pathophysiological um, um, markers, such so as atroph atrophic fibers. You see these very small fibers, very long, long, long fibers, and they were much, much more apparent in the patients compared to the controls. Um, but particularly, uh, we saw areas of, of muscle damage in the muscle after, particularly after exercise in the patients. Now, that's of course a, a serious uh, a, a concern, but we also noticed that there were signs of regeneration occurring. So into the nuclei, these, these uh, 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 cell nuclei that are inside, right inside the muscle fiber, uh, as well as regenerating fibers here, um, they are signs that muscles are able to regenerate as well after the damage occurred. So next we, we, we found also um, uh, markers of uh, in, immune cell infiltration in the skeletal muscle in patients. We saw some T cell, um, a CD3, that's a T cell marker, in, in the tissue in patients before and after exercise, and, but the response was actually blunted in the patients compared to the controls. Macrophage, macrophage infiltration also was higher in the, in the patients compared to the controls, and but we didn't see any B cells, so the B cells compartment was very empty in the in, in skeletal muscle. So we do think that there is an, an immune response occurring in patients, but we don't know, really know to why and how, what, what it's doing there. The next, but the last thing that we, we checked in this, in, in, in this study was whether the viral persistence could explain our results. So we opted to stain for an N, uh, a nucleocapsid protein, which is the N protein that is inside, this, in, inside the, uh, uh, the long COVID virus. And we saw that actually in every one, uh, we saw some uh, remaining SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein remnants in, in the skeletal muscle. That suggests that, that, that everyone who got infected, we, that they, everyone had to have a, uh, undergo an, an acute COVID infection, has some re maybe some remnants of the virus inside the skeletal muscle or in other tissues. But there was no difference between the patients and the controls, and also after exercise, they did not change. So to, to wrap up the, uh, the, the, the study, uh, we, we do think that there are different contributions uh, of the reduced excess capacity in patients, as well as the induction of post exertion malaise. So we have mitochondrial respiration that uh, is, is contributing to reduce excess capacity, metabolized relative fatigue, more glycolytic fibers. And then there's a more rapid change occurring with the induction of post exertion malaise. So local and systemic metabolic changes we find uh, in patients after induction of PEM. We see markers that are uh, uh, similar to muscle damage but also recovery, uh, infiltration of immune cells, uh, but not more virus. So the, 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 the criticism that we always got was like, okay, all these things here uh, can be just due to deconditioning. And that's why uh, what we're currently doing in the lab, um, and uh, our PhD student, Braden, teamed up with another PhD student, uh, Moritz, who is uh, working on a Petras project uh, in collaboration with NASA and ASA, where we ask patients or people, healthy people, to undergo a 60-day bed rest period. And uh, before and after, we, take, we took muscle biopsies so that we can compare what the effect, what the changes are that we see after st uh, strict uh, bed rest in healthy people uh, compared to both uh, the long COVID population as well as in MACFS population. So just to get you, give you a little bit of an idea of what, 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 what our patients are do, or people are doing when they go and undergoing a bed rest study, they essentially lay in bed for 60 days, flat. Everything has to be done uh, horizontally, um, uh, brushing teeth, but they also undergo MRI scans, and we took muscle biopsies from those, uh, those healthy participants. And that allows us to, to make a distinction between uh, the change that we see in the skeletal muscle with deconditioning and the disease. 
what I can explain to you is that we really see different changes in the, in the skeletal muscle after deconditioning only compared to the post-viral diseases. So we think it's not to do with deconditioning. So just to take home messages, uh, many patients with long COVID and MEC MECFS suffer from both of those malaise. Um, and I really want to stress that, uh, that, that it's, it's worth not using the term exertional dyspnea or just fatigue when you actually really mean post exertion malaise. That's something more than just only fatigue. Exercise above the spam threshold is counterproductive for uh, recovery for patients. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a clear uh, uh, comment also for, for clinicians and uh, physiotherapists. Uh, but this threshold is patient and time dependent, and we know that different factors contribute to the explaining of uh, exercise, reduced exercise capacity and PEM. But we do not know the underlying X factor. That's really important to remember, because we also know, of course, that cognitive and mental exertion can also cause some symptoms of PEM. And we also now uh, know, and uh, something that I discussed also with colleagues in the last few days, uh, is that the uh, the, the skeletal muscle alterations after strict bed rest are really different from post-viral diseases. So lastly, I need to acknowledge all the people that have contributed to this, particularly Braden, uh, Brent and Michelle, the clinicians in our team, and all the funding uh, that we received recently, uh, including the ME Research UK that we recently received, and Yella will be appointed for that since yesterday. Thank you very much.